Thank you for being here at this transportation breakout session uh, at the Arizona League uh, Cities and Towns Conference. We appreciate you being here. Uh, we have a great lineup of speakers for you today, um, and we want to make sure that we provide enough time for you afterwards uh, to ask questions and uh, find out a little bit more, more about what's going on. Um, we have a couple of reminders here for you. Uh, again, my name is Christian Price. I am the mayor of the city of Maricopa, and I have the privilege of moderating this session. Um, as you know, if you'd like to find out more about these two gentlemen up here, you can uh, go to the uh, uh, website or the app. Uh, you can find their bios and all their information is out there. Please turn off your cell phones. Uh, keep them on silent just so that you're not disturbing others around you. And uh, we've got a variety of fun topics here today to discuss. Um, so first off, we have Dallas Hammett here. He's representing the Arizona uh, uh, Department of Transportation, or ADOT. And uh, he's going to talk to us uh, today about uh, quite a few things going on in the state and statewide transportation. And then we also have Anthony Bedell, who is our uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for the US, U.S. Department of Transportation under Secretary Chow. And so so we are very, very grateful that he's here today as well. We're going to be talking uh, about transportation on the federal level and what that means for us in our cities and towns. So without too much further ado, I'm going to invite Anthony to come on up to the podium. He's going to talk for a little bit, uh, and then it'll be Dallas's turn, uh, after which we want to uh, address some questions. I know I have some questions. Uh, I've tried to give them some advance notice of that so they could kind of hit some of those points to you all. And uh, at the same time, we really want to hear from you. So uh, throw them some hard ones. and. Uh, Take no, no, take no prisoners, so <laughs> sorry guys, uh, but we'd like to put you on the hot seat. Anthony, come on up. I didn't agree to that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, on behalf of Secretary Chow, she wanted me to, me to extend her greetings to you. Um, she often says in her speeches, and she means it, that our success at the, at the US DOT is going to be determined by your success. It's a full partnership. It's something we want to enter into. It's kind of a paradigm shift of where US DOT has been in the past. But with the lack of the ability of the federal government to come in with the larger percentages than we have in the past, we've been asking states and localities to come and put more skin in the game with bringing state and local leverage, particularly to our, our grant programs and other things that we do. Uh, with that, we want you to be able to leverage our federal dollar for another state dollar, another local dollar, a dollar, and if, and if possible, a private dollar. And that's something that we have a goal of looking at 20% federal, 80% state, local, private, but we realize that's going to take time. But we are seeing it anecdotally out there that states and localities are putting skin in the game. Arizona is a leader in that and have been for a long time. And we point to Arizona, Virginia, Georgia, and some of the other states that are starting to see that. We're also starting to see rural communities and small cities uh, start to understand that, that that's a paradigm shift going on in transportation and something we're going to need to look at long term. And so she realizes that, and she wants to be a full partner with you. And that's something that I know our folks in federal highways and our other modes have been working on uh, locally and in the regions to making sure we have that open line of communication with you. And we're doing all we can to provide you access to the funding that we have available, which is some of the things I'll go over. And I'm not going to speak for 30 minutes because I know you guys just had lunch and I don't want to put you to sleep. But um, quickly, I'll just go over the Secretary's priorities. Uh, they're very simple. Number one is safety. Uh, every morning she comes in and senior staff receives her safety briefing. And um, if you think about, obviously, every mode of transportation that we touch, every morning she gets the FAA, highways, MIRAD, well, everything got down the list of any incidents, any security issues, and her priority is to keep all of our citizens and taxpayers who use our transportation system safe. So that's number one. Number two is infrastructure. Uh, the President and the Secretary put out a very uh, broad proposal uh, earlier this year and a number of things that you probably have already read about. Um, we were hoping that Congress would act this year. Uh, obviously they didn't, but what they did do is plus up a lot of our department's uh, appropriations budgets, which I'll touch on in a bit particularly in transportation where they gave us an additional $12 billion in our budget. What they're trying to do is they recognize that an infrastructure bill right now was difficult to do, but they basically said, okay, let's just give you the money. We align with your priorities to some degree. Let's get this money out as quickly as we can. So you've seen that we've given uh, a last round of $500 million for Tiger Grants. We just did $1.5 billion in infra awards. We have just finished receiving all of our um, build grants, which are Old Tiger, a little bit different criteria, which is also um, $1.5 billion. 
we are going to have that money out as our goal by October. And it's an ambitious goal, and we have career policy teams that are locked in the basement right now. They haven't seen their families in months who are reviewing all their grants right now. <laughs> we'll let them up to uh, shave and say hello again, and then we lock them back in the basement because then, after we award that $1.5 billion, we go right to eight nine hundred fifty million again where we'll put out a new NOFO for infra. And then right now, currently in our FY19 omnibus bill, we have one, another one billion slated for build again, which we would turn around probably in the same timeline this year with the goal of getting both of those amounts of money out by the end of next fiscal year, which would be next October 2019. This is the Secretary's priority is to get this money out as much and as fast as we can because of the significance of what you all are doing on the state and local level. The third priority is regulatory relief. Some of this you may not be seeing yet. I think you will see it as we go forward. The President issued an executive order where we are to eliminate two regulations for every one that we promulgate. Luckily at the Department of Transportation we've been able to do it at a nine to one rate. We found regulations that go as far back as regulating the horse and buggy whips. True story. And um, I th we've also been able to take our great career staff who are, who are true professionals and really take the seriousness of, of the Department of Transportation and what they do in their profession uh, very seriously. And they, we've been able to say, hey, why not, look, instead of doing it this way, why don't we look at it this way? And how can we do it in making safety a priority, the environment's obviously a priority, but how can we do it to save money on who this impacts you know, downstream? So we've actually had career staff come back and say, hey, we think we can we can keep the same objectives of this rule, but maybe we can do it in a different way where we're finding savings and monies and regulatory relief going forward. And that's been a great uh, outcome that we've achieved. And I think we're projecting close to a half a million dollars or more in savings this coming fiscal year, and then for 19, even more, a billion. And hopefully by the end of our first term, close to four, uh, three to four billion in regulatory relief savings, which is the goal. Our Deputy Secretary, Jeff Rosen, was General Counsel of the Office of Management and Budget. So he, has a, he oversees our regulatory relief uh, committee, and he's doing a great job leading that with all of our modal administrators. And so obviously the point is that he has the background and understanding how these regulations can be impactful, both in a positive and negative way. Um, the final piece of her priorities is innovation. Um, and this is on all levels. And I think most of you realize it, but if you don't realize it, Autonomous vehicles, drones, all of that is right around the corner. That's not 20 years from now. That's not the Jetsons in the cartoon. It's happening right now. I've ridden some of the autonomous vehicle test tracks and loops all over the country. There are a lot of, of opportunities where you know, BRT and other modes of transit are going are to start becoming an, through an autonomous vehicle loops more end to end. And as you see in transit as, as rideshare and Uber and Lyft and BRT, and autonomous vehicles comes, we're gonna to have to rethink how we do some larger city transit, and this even includes sometimes, you know, a lot of the small cities are gonna to have to look at that as a mode of transportation moving forward as well. Drone delivery. We just awarded 10 drone pilot programs across the country that vary from, in Lake County, Florida, we have a 1,500 pound drone that is flying around Florida right now. Could you pull that microphone up? Sure, I'll do my best. Uh, a drone right now that is flying around the Lake County, Florida, eliminating mosquitoes. And in San Diego, they are doing a pilot program where they will have uh, drones delivering food during football and baseball games. So this is coming, and well, there's also another pilot program that has the delivery of blood and organ transplants between hospitals in towns and cities as well. And so th these are things we have to start looking at is who owns the airspace, at what point does FAA pick up, or what point is it the locality, we're working through these things right now. Autonomous vehicles. We can't promulgate a rule and Congress can't pass a law fast enough to keep up with the industry and the technology that's going out. So we're issuing another round of guidance, which is non-binding framework. Uh, probably in October that will be AV 3.0 that will start to give localities a little more guidance on how we're going to approach how you want to run autonomous vehicles, cybersecurity, all the things that we do moving forward. Because this is going to be here uh, probably within five to ten years. Uh, and maybe sooner. A prime example of that is the city of Chicago just entered into an agreement with the Boring Company, which is Elon Musk's company, and they're going to build a hyperloop from downtown Chicago Station, which I have been in and seen, and all the way to O'Hare that will get you back and forth from O'Hare in 15 minutes. The skate you'll be on is a uh, tire made, holds 16 people, and goes 125 miles an hour. It runs on a continuous loop. 
that will be done probably within four to five years. That's true. I didn't believe it until I saw it, and it's actually going. They're looking at building uh, more tunnel systems between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. Same kind of idea. And they're also looking at doing that under the Baltimore-Washington Parkway. So all of these things are coming, and they're coming very quickly. And as you all know, sometimes industry moves faster than the government, probably most times. But the point being is we have to stay ahead of that. And the other things we want to do is we're looking to invest in transformative projects. And yes, it's great that we want to work with the larger urban areas, and those are just as important. But we also want to identify projects in, in counties and cities that where you know we give a $25 billion build grant to uh, a larger city, it will have an impact, but not on the scale. It could be a $25 million build grant in Tolleson or you know, in some other city that I visited this week. And that's what we want to do. We want to have those transformative projects being innovative, fixing things in your localities that are going to be long-term and are going to have a significant impact. That's why you've seen the administration really double down on rural and small city donations. This last round of build that just came in, we, the, the prior Tiger, had, we had 400 and plus applications for about $7 billion. This round of build, we had 887 applications, totaling over $11 billion in asks. 60% of those applications were from rural and small cities. So you see the trend of where we're going, and every single one of the applications had some type of state and local leverage in it. So it's starting to happen, and the mindset's starting to change. And that's the emphasis we want to have is, is, is making long-lasting impact on your localities as something that is significant to the secretary and the administration. Um, as far as what we've uh, I've gone over some of the build and next rounds of infra that we're going to have going forward, and the department will issue no foes on those as we go forward. And I think my, my contact information also has been made available to you all. I certainly did not bring enough cards uh, for all of you, but I'll give that out. Um, that is my real cell phone and direct line and email on there. I do respond, as does my team, and that's important to the secretary because if she hears that I'm not, she will let me know, and um, that's not always fun. But it's, it's something that we pride ourselves on is that outreach and to be a partner with you and answer your questions, get to the people you need to know on highways or transit or FRA or any of the other modes that we work in motor carriers, et cetera. But what, one thing that we're also able to do is, and we have to spend this money by August, October 1st, they give us an additional $12.6 billion in, in uh, additional monies. We gave out $3.5 billion in additional uh, highway trust fund formula funds, so that went to the states and is being spent. We have another $2.6 billion for the capital investment grants at FTA. We are figuring out what we are trying to do with that money right now, given that we're having an internal debate on where exactly we want to spend those monies. Is it light rail, is it BRT, commuter rail, all those kind of programs that fall under the transit. And then we did another, obviously, 1.5 billion in build, which just came in, we'll have that out by October 1st. And then another 1 billion in airport improvement grants, which we actually have an additional, so I think it's a total of three we're getting out. And those are designed for regional airports and smaller airports to help extend their runway, build out their gate capacity, and start to, these regional airports are starting to have more and more airlines run through them as opposed to the larger uh, airports, LAX, Sky Harbor, et cetera. And so they need to catch up so that we can, we can get commuter airlines into these regional areas, which helps economic development and growth and to keep up with your growth. Those are grants that we need to get out this year through the FAA. And they're designed, again, for improving your runway, lengthening your runway so you can get larger jets in, and then your gate capacity and other things that you need to keep your airport um, up and running and, and relevant in this area where you know air tra travel is just increasing. We're having a pilot shortage, which we're trying to work on. We're also trying to address the need for people to travel regionally as opposed to traveling to the large airports and down. And so there's going to be a, another FAA is going to be looking at the way we've been changing routes and how we can do region to region as opposed to large hub to region, et cetera. We're working with the airlines on that as well. So in a nutshell, that's basically what we've been working on since this secretary was sworn in February 21st of last year. When I got there in May, there were 34 of us as the appointees were capped at 110 for a 55,000 size department. We're now at about 85, so we are running a little more full capacity, but we haven't skipped a beat because we have great career staff that have stepped up in many roles who uh, really engage and believe in what we're doing as far as improving infrastructure. And we also have a secretary who drives the agenda and a very professional non-career slash political staff who have long uh, history and, and experience in Washington 
and hopefully that uh, you'll see it, you're seeing that and hopefully that gives you that some comfort that we are on the job and doing what we can to making sure we have this partnership with you and that we're getting the monies out and the grant agreements that we want to and that's something that we want to make sure as again our success is going to be determined by your success so with that I'll stop and turn it over to Dallas and then after that I'm happy to take as many questions as you need on any topic so thank you So I'll probably get a little further in the weeds than Anthony did, but we'll see how we can go here. Here we go. So I set mine up. Uh, Mayor Price gave us questions. So I didn't want him to ask me any questions. So I'm going to answer them during the presentation. <laughs> so as we, we go through, um, you know, he asked me to talk about the long range plan. He mentioned high speed rail. Well, Edita, um, we don't do a lot of rail, but we did do a passenger rail study. So I'll touch on that. Um, how does the economy and transportation work together? So I'm going to, you know, talk a little bit about our key commerce corridors. Developing local projects. What can we do at the Department of Transportation or ADOT, Arizona Department of Transportation, to make that happen? And last, you know, what are some upcoming projects um, in, in the area? So first, with our long-range plan, um, it's timely because this long-range plan, our State Transportation Board um, adopted it this past February. Um, and, and different than some long-range plans that go through, um, we're going to do this project, this project, this project. It's an investment strategy. What are we going to spend funds on? And, and you'll see that as I go through. So we, we look at a few things, and that's not coming up on the screen, so I'm going to look back. But it's a policy document. It helps the department plan projects as well as our, our partners in the um, COGS and MPOs. We want it to be data driven. Um, we get guidance from um, our federal partners, but we do it because we think it's the right thing to do. We need to pick projects based on data and performance. We need to fix the roads um, and, and fix issues based on what's really happening. So we're going to have to collect data to do that. And this plan is a recommended funding um, alternatives. So how much money do we spend on preserving what we have versus how much do we spend on expanding our current system versus modernizing our system and that could include turn lanes or safety improvements so all of those are needed in a transportation system but how do we balance those so one of the first things we did is look at what areas so like the secretary safety was our number one area that we looked at um, we looked at our infrastructure um, condition congestion you know, that means different for um, different people. When I lived in Prescott Valley, when it took me a while to get into Prescott, that was congestion. But when I moved to Phoenix, it was a different type of congestion that I saw. Um, reliability. How reliable is our system? And if it takes me um, 20 minutes to go eight miles, but it always takes me that, I can plan for it. But when it takes me you know, 20 minutes one day, an hour the next day, our system isn't reliable. So how can we work with reliability into our system? We also want to look at how can we move freight and um, help the, our economy grow, use our transportation system to help our economy grow. And then we want to be environmental sensitive and sustaining. We want to have a, a system, we learn we can build roadways and transportation facilities and take care of the environment at the same time. They are not um, opposing. So one of the first things we did is we went to ask you, and, and hopefully maybe somebody in here was surveyed in, in this. I know we went to a lot of the COGS and MPOs and asked what's important to you when we build a long way transportation. And what we heard was maintain what you have. That is very important. We don't want to let our transportation, our current system completely fall apart. So um, we did hear that. We also heard though, we do need to expand. Um, we're a growing state, congestion is a challenge, so um, we do need to put some money in um, expanding our system. 
and safety is very important. And as, as we talk to folks, and um, as I hear people that come to our board, you know, safety is the number one priority, but we get there lots of different ways. I can do a safety project, which is, we just call a safety project maybe at shoulders. But if I do a, um, and I was talking to um, our division administrator um, as we came in, a pavement preservation, because I laid out where are my crashes, it's on our rough roads. So if I get our, our roads where they're not as rough, I've improved safety without calling it a safety project. So we're, get, we're getting multiple improvements as we go through. So what do we need? Well, as we look at, these are our needs, and, and we got that as a transportation, about $9 billion in the next 25 years um, for preservation, about the same in modernization. Again, those are um, new signals, um, say a roundabout, uh, a small um, intersection improvements or, or safety improvements, $34 billion in expansion, so $53 billion. So what do we got? Get about twenty-two billion that we forecast coming in. So we have about a thirty plus million billion dollar gap in the next twenty-five years. So we need to look at different solutions. And, and as Anthony talked about, how can we leverage funds from the state to compete for um, grants and other opportunities on the national level? And that's what we, we want to do. So how do we do we take that investment strategy on a more um, five-year program or a year-to-year -year basis? We divided it up, um, as you can see, they're about 35% on um, preserving our system, 18% on modernization, and 47% um, on expansion. Now that's the whole state has um, put in there. And we have two metropolitan areas that have sales tax that fund their areas, so theirs are gonna be a little different than greater Arizona. So what, what do we see in the, the MAG area? About 87% of theirs is going to be expansion. They're going to use that um, sales tax to leverage and, and to grow their system. Same way in Tucson, or even a little more, about, well, 77% of their system is expansion. And on there, as you'll see later, but it's expanding that ITN corridor. In greater Arizona, there's not much expansion that you see up there. It is almost all um, preservation and um, in a modernization. Not because that's what we want to build, because my team likes to build new roads better than preserving old roads. It's more fun to get to do stuff like that. It's, that's how much money we have to work with. We do believe we need to set aside money and look for opportunities for grant proposals. Um, Tiger was mentioned, now build. We've been very fortunate over the last few years. The last two Tiger rounds, we were successful. We, we got a, a project in Mayor Price's area the time before last, and then in um, the Nogales area, this last round on 189. When um, Infra, before it was, and when it was called FAST, we received a $53 million grant, and I think it was the third biggest nationally for I-10 to make improvements there. So we have been successful. The problem with success is the last round, I'd won three in a row, so I was expecting the fourth automatically. We didn't win the fourth, but we're still um, proposing and going forward. So. Um, we, we did make um, two applications for a bill grant on this last round. And I know there's a number of cities and others that also submitted in addition to what the department submitted. Switching gears, um, our rail plan. Arizona um, and ADOT works with um, the, the Federal Rail Administration on a rail study. ADOT does not operate a, any kind of a rail, either freight or commercial, um, but we do do some planning in, in that area. We went through and we um, did a, a study and improved on a passenger rail. Our, our, on this one, we updated, just updated the, um, the freight a, a national study, but we also did a tier one environmental study for what would a passenger rail system look like from Tucson to Phoenix. And it's hard to see on this map, but you can see the yellow line. And in that study, it's a corridor, so it's not an exact um, alignment. I think it's about a 2,000 foot corridor. But that's where we see that a rail, a passenger rail um, system would work. 
So what's the difference between high speed and passenger? So when I went and talked to our folks, um, our passenger rail system, we're looking at a system between 70 and 80 miles an hour versus 100 plus in a high speed rail um, system. That um, study was completed. The tier one was approved. Where are we at now? Without funding, without um, a funding source, that's where that study is going to stay until, until we have some funding to move forward. Right now, um, there's not any money that ADOT can use, because right now our funds from the state are for highways only. So we can't use funds for any other mode. But um, we do, we're ready if either we had a change in our, in our um, legislature says, hey, we think this is very important, we want to fund it, we're ready to go, or um, some other opportunities come forward. Switch gears again on transportation and the economy. And you, if you've heard ADOT present in the last couple of years, um, you've probably heard us talk about our key commerce corridors. But we still believe strongly in that, that our transportation system is essential to drive the economy. We need to find opportunities. How can we build it here and sell it over there? How can we in, uh, increase our business and um, people wanting to come to Arizona and drive our economy with key commerce corridors? So we, we've presented this plan and you, you can see these routes are, are put together on where can we drive freight and drive the economy through our state? And why is it important in Arizona to make sure this works? One of the things in Arizona, we're strategically or geographically located very well. We're dropped right in the middle of two major um, business hubs, California and Texas. For freight coming through from the ports at Long Beach and um, LA, we're one truck day away. Trucks have certain um, hours they can go. You can get to basically the Phoenix core, the Sun Corridor, in one truck day. We're two truck days away from the areas of Dallas and Houston. So we're, sit we're in a great place that we could leverage that opportunity, as well as our opportunity to go north-south. We're right in line to, to go um, our number one um, trading partner with Mexico. How can we leverage that and cre increase those opportunities? We are planning those. And if you look at our, our projects come through, you can see there's a lot of projects that are on those corridors that will drive the economy. I was also asked, well, how can, what, what can we do with the local program? And one of the biggest is the safety program. For lots of years, the ADOT, the program, said, okay, we're going to take 80% of the money, we'll give 20% to locals, and um, that's how we're going to divide it up. You know, I like to spend money, um, so I'm going to keep 80% for me. We want to drive down fatals in the state, and a fatal on a city street or state highway still means somebody lost their life, and we need to put the money where we're going to make that difference. So we've instituted a competitive process and taken out where the, the, the lines between boundaries of roads. Where can we spend it to make the biggest bang for the buck? Um, we, we have that open competition. And in 2021, the projects that will be delivered in those years, 43, I mean, excuse me, 31 of 47 projects are on local roads versus state highways. And in um, 2022, 61% um, or almost 62% of the money will be spent on local roads versus state highways because that's where the data took us where the fatalities and serious action, accidents are happening. So we're looking to put the money where we can make the biggest difference. The other areas where we, we believe um, we can take advantage and help the locals is bringing back curf exchange. So there, there's, there's funds that um, we had put out that are federal funds, but most of them, especially in, in greater Arizona and the rural areas, they're small projects. And to, to treat a small project and develop it like a big project, it just doesn't make sense. It costs a lot of money just to start a federal process. So for years we had what we called herf exchange. When the economy got bad, we didn't have the cash to make that work and it went away. 
So this past year, we've reinstituted that. It's open. This is an opportunity for smaller communities to say, hey, we were given this much in federal dollars. We'll exchange it, and now you have control. You can administer the project. You're given the state HERF funds. We exchange it. We do um, have, um, it's 90 cents on the dollar because um, there is a match that, that's required for us to take back the um, federal grant or the federal funds that we have to put in. But you control your destiny. You hire the engineer. You administer the project and can make that happen. So we're just getting going again. But um, what I've heard is we've had lots of people coming in and making applications, and we look for this to um, go forward. So I'm going to bounce through some projects real quick because I know you have a lot of questions for Anthony, so I want to give him lots of time <laughs> to answer questions. But um, I was asked, what big projects are, are coming in? So here I have some in all the regions. By no means is this all the projects in the state. But um, a couple of them that's coming up, um, one that I'm excited about, it's out on the street for advertisement right now, is at Happy Valley. Um, it's a traffic interchange, so why is Dallas excited about that? This will be our first diverging diamond interchange. So for those of you who don't know what a diverging diamond, it will sound a little weird at first um, that, hey, why would um, ADOT have me going on the right side, cross me over to the left side, across the intersection, and cross me back, cross back on the other side? We've seen great success in safety and um, operational efficiencies with other states that have done this. So this is our first go at this. Um, this is out in um, at Happy Valley near a shopping center. And it was really funny. We, we presented it at a, um, a public meeting, and there was 300-plus people. I thought we were going to get killed. Um, I, I t accused the team of um, putting a plan out there because the gentleman stood up and said, hey, the roundabouts are working fine. Um, you don't do anything. Everyone booed him and loved our project after that. So um, we didn't have any. Um, <laughs> disagreements. There is one in Tucson that's coming up at Houghton Road, so um, that one is in early development as well. A couple design build projects um, that are coming out on the 101, one up near I-17 to Pima, the other on the Price Freeway. Those will be design build um, projects, the um, farther north ones, about $150 million. Um, the, the one on the Price Freeway is, I think it's about 50 plus million. You can see it there. And then um, Whoop, that was the, the $50 million one. Oh, SR24. Um, we, we have a project on continuing the SR24 coming off um, the, 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 the Loop 202. And um, the next two years, we're extending Loop 303. So on the west side, we, we have a project there that'll go south of I-10. Um, we, we're going to have another project on um, Loop 101 um, in the Northeast Valley in the Scottsdale area. A big one, $480 million. This is what we call the Broadway Curve Project. Um, it'll be the second biggest project that the state has done. The current Loop 202, about $1.6 billion, um, was our biggest. This will be the, our second biggest project. It will be run um, as a design-build project, but we're going to use some lessons learned we learned from our P3 to make that happen. Real quick, some jobs in the Tucson area. I mentioned Houghton Road. It is a, a diverging diamond interchange. Um, we're going to expand I-10 between I-10 and Ruth Roth, if you're from that area, and complete the um, Ruth Roth interchange. And then in greater Arizona, there's not a lot of expansion projects, about one per year um, that you'll see in there. Um, we, we have some work on 189. That one, um, we, we received some money from our legislature, gave us $25 million in addition out of general fund to do that, which helped us leverage the $25 million for the Tiger Grant that we received. There's also some um, fees for trucks coming out of the border. They, they'd ask, can we run produce? It makes a lot of sense because um, they're already packaged um, and, and inspected. Can we run? Um, heavy, so 90,000 pounds versus um, 88,000 um, pounds. Sure, but it costs us, it'll damage the road more, so they pay a, a fee. That money's going to go into this project as well. So that, that one's going forward. We're looking at I-17. How can we expand that? There's about $190 million um, in that corridor. It's going to take 300 to do everything we want to do on there, but 
we want to get started and, and get some relief. And the last one's um, the um, 260 um, as you leave Payson. There's a project there. The last projects in Greater Arizona are, if you look at that key commerce or a potential I-11 corridor, you can see we're making improvements on that. It will not be an interstate. It divides the roadways with the median, so it looks kind of like an interstate, but will be at grade intersections, so it will not be a full interstate. We have a number of projects going up that corridor. My last slide, um, studies that we're doing, I-11 study. This is a tier one study. So basically we're gonna get a concept and an idea where the road's gonna be. It's a um, 2,000 foot corridor and we will know the freeway when there's funding to build it, at least it's in this corridor so people can do land use planning and, and, and do some work in there. That goes from Nogales up to Wickenburg and we're looking at options. The north-south corridor, um, that one, wait. Yep, north-south is in there. That one is in a tier one study. We look for um, a record of, of a decision on that in about a year. And then the last one is a project in the Tucson area. It takes a road between Interstate 19 and Interstate 10. Um, how can we connect those and stay out of the urbanized area if we have freight wanting to go east? So I went through things very quickly, but Mayor Price, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to turn some time over to questions. Uh, obviously Dallas doesn't want any, so you should throw lots of them at him. <laughs> and uh, Anthony has told me that he really likes the interaction, and I, I know that from hanging out with him a little bit. Uh, he likes that back and forth. And I think that at the end of the day, uh, there's probably lots of questions that you want to know, how it interacts with your communities. Uh, clearly there's lots of need in the state uh, and in your individual communities, but there's always not enough uh, transportation funding to go around. So we want to hear from you and uh, start some uh, line of questioning. Alex over here from the league is going to pass around the microphone. So if you have a question, just kind of raise your hand and we'll try and get to everybody today. So let's start over here. And sorry, Dallas, this is for you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, how, Thank did, you. how did ADOT quantify uh, passenger rail or, or at least investigating passenger rail from Phoenix to Tucson? Um, and are you looking at all at commuter rail um, within, the, within the valley to, to ease congestion and do some other things and take some of the traffic off the roads within the, within the valley? So right now what ADOT's doing, um, and unfortunately with, with where our mandate is on our responsibility, was that study uh, from Phoenix to Tucson. And the way we got kind of screwed at how much we could do, because that is out of our wheelhouse, if we expand I-10, uh, and look at vehicle traffic, we can't do it or we're going to build lots of lanes. So we stretched our mandate a little bit by saying one way to mitigate how many lanes we build is having rail. Um, so that, that's how we did that passenger study, but doing an overall within the, um, the metropolitan areas is, isn't anything we're working on at present time because it's outside of our mandate and our scope, what we can work on at the DOT right now. Who would use it? Our, um, where we did, we, we did surveys and, and in that planning study, and, and I'd be happy to make that planning study available because it did um, have its methodology on how did it predict ridership, who, who would be in there, you know, if, the, if it's high speed, you know, I would use it if it got me there in less time if, if I drove. But if it takes more time, I wouldn't use it. You know, those are different questions people were asked. But I'd be happy to make that available um, so you could see that. Other questions? Just a quick question. This is probably more for ADOT. Um, wrong way driver issues. Um, I think there was something done on that, a study or some sort of resolution to that uh, some months ago. Could you talk about that and how problematic is it in the Valley? So it, it, it is a problem. Now, how do we define a problem? About 1.7% of our fatal crashes last year were wrong way drivers. So if I look at just the numbers, it's not a huge issue. 
but a wrong way crash is very likely to go fatal. So how can we stop that? What ADOT did is we had a pilot area that the I-17 corridor, um, basically from the I-10 intersection up to the Loop 101, where we installed thermal cameras. First time it's been done in the country that will detect um, a wrong way driver incursion on the roadway. As an engineer, I look for things to fix. And one of the problems we had with wrong way drivers, we, don't, we didn't know where they got on the freeway. There was no detection. We found out they were on the freeway when they called nine, someone saw them and called 911. This wrong way driver detection allows us to know exactly when they got on. This system also immediately without a person being involved, alerts law enforcement, so you don't have to make sure someone's awake at the wheel. Law enforcement's notified it immediately. There's a illuminated sign that tells them, hey, you're going the wrong way. For a long time, we said, hey, we got great reflective sign, but if I'm impaired and I don't turn on my lights, that reflective sign doesn't mean anything because I can't see it. These will, are self-lit, so um, we can, the wrong way drivers are um, notified and then we can also track them as they go down the freeway. So the systems work well. There's been one incursion um, to the freeway since we, we've had it up in January. There, last I saw, there were 21 that got on the um, ramp the wrong way, but self-corrected. That is, um, we're, we're evaluating that. It's expensive, it's, um, so can we do it everywhere? But at least parts of it, we're looking, um, the detection is our new standard. We're putting it up at all signals. Just one additional question regarding technology and the use of technology in future infrastructure planning. Uh, we're seeing other countries and other states realizing the dynamics with technology, with smart cities, smart highways. Is there a visioning committee or, or is uh, any work being done in the state to vision what the future will hold utilizing te technology so we don't continually have to expand lanes because now we can platoon uh, certain vehicle uh, traffic, uh, certainly the 18-wheeler cargo traffic. The, the group that's probably had the lead, and it's led by Maricopa County, um, but the, there's members from the whole area, it's, it's called Aztec, Arizona um, Technology. We, we look at the smart cities, we look at how can we connect signals. So if the signal can tell my car when the, the light's going to turn, I can adjust my speed. Hopefully I'm, I'm not speeding up to run it. Um, but I can, if, if I know, if I go 30 and I don't have to speed and I'll hit every green light, it may convince me to drive that speed limit and we can communicate with folks. But that area, um, that communication, Aztec, and it's very, um, lots of members um, in the um, Maricopa area. There's not really a, a similar one statewide other than like ITS um, Arizona. Thank you. If I could add to that, yeah, we, uh, in the Secretary's office, we have um, men and women working on what it looks like moving forward with smart cities and how we share data aggregation and how we share best practices with cities. We have a number that are doing uh, uh, a lot of things right now, Las Vegas, Austin, Columbus, Denver, and so on, who are working on the things that you just mentioned. And what we want to do uh, from a USDOT point of view is try to gather that data, work with the cities, and then share that with best practices with any city and state moving forward so that we are using the, the best ideas and how we look at um, how it's managing exactly what doing platooning cars, managing freight traffic and et cetera. And that's something that we're working on internally and hope to have some more announcements on as we move forward. Columbus has started uh, down the road of doing a number of things on the Smart Cities Initiative grant that we gave out to them I think in 2015 and they just received an additional 15 million of their 40 to start into the uh, aggregation and linking their their innovation centers and their ride shares and that's some that's some of the things that we're going to be sharing with the other cities and i think we're going to hold a some type of smart city summit next year where we'll bring them in and any you know, number of other folks and we'll probably also offer ways to uh, to see that on webcam for those who are interested just try to start having a national conversation on that so it's a little more of a framework and best practices ideas for that too as well I actually have a couple of issues. I want to compliment you on the uh, clever signage that you guys put up every now and then uh, on, on freeways when there's not an accident or something going on to kind of humor us as we're driving along. Also, I wanted to ask you about the so-called safety corridors that I see designated on several 
um, mostly interstates, I think, around the state. What exactly those mean? I mean, I'm not sure what they mean. I come up to one that says safety corridor, but I don't know what the heck it means. Can you tell me what that is? You bet. There, there's four um, safety corridors right now um, that have been identified in the state. Um, two in rural areas, basically on I-40. I call it between the 93 because 93 splits off as you go up to Vegas. You go on 40 for a while, and at Kingman you go up through. And then I-10 leaving um, south of Phoenix, between Phoenix and Tucson. And then two in the urban um, Phoenix area, one on I-10 where as you go towards the tunnel, and then US-60. What we did, and, and that was my question, if you want to do a safety corridor, what does that mean? There's additional enforcement on that corridor. Um, what enforcement will tell you that there's um, less tolerance? They started saying zero, but it, it, they greatly reduced. You know, a lot of times, hey, I can get away with 10 over. You're going to get ticketed um, for five over or less in some of those, those corridors. How did we identify them? We looked, we went with the data. Where were the most crashes and serious um, accidents? And where did DPS or our law enforcement have the most citations? So the Department of Transportation and Public Safety worked together to identify those corridors. Senator Kavanaugh. Thank you. By the way, comment on the safety corridor. I'll think about that explanation the next time I'm in one, obeying the law, and thousands of drivers are cutting me off and honking their horn at me as they pass me. But that's something else. Uh, quick question. Uh, I get a lot of requests. I mean, well, not a lot, but throughout my entire office holding, it's a steady stream. People always asking me, why don't you ban trucks in the left lane of this highway? Why don't you say passing vehicles only in the left lane of this highway? Uh, what, in terms of traffic engineers and highway people, uh, I mean, why do you rarely see that? Uh, and, and what's the rationale or criteria you use for that? It, it would take a couple of things. Um, we do have it in a few areas. Um, I-17, um, leaving Black Canyon City up to um, Sunset Point, a few on I-40, when usually we do it where there's a grade and you don't want the two trucks racing, one at 15 miles an hour, the other at 17 miles an hour, going <laughs> up, up the slope. Um, it would be nice, um, we, we would take legislation, it's more than what the, the department can do, um, to move trucks over um, only in the right lane. Um, and, and for me, if, if they can travel the speed limit, I'm okay with them going over there. But I think part of your point is, the people that camp out in the left lane and don't move over once they pass. And, and I know we've worked with law enforcement. One of those clever signs that someone mentioned earlier, um, camping in the forest, not in the left lane, um, <laughs> was something that law enforcement asked us to put up. Um, can we get in there? Law enforcement is ticketing. Um, they are greatly understaffed, so if they have a choice of looking at a speeder or something else are patrolling for left lane violators, the left lane violators are usually going to have a good shot of not being ticketed. There are laws, um, but it isn't the, I guess, the emphasis of enforcement right now. I don't know if that answers your question completely. Four lanes in each direction? Um, I, I need to think about that one um, to see where, where we go. But thank you. Yeah, I got a, a question. I, I know ADOT has certain criteria for putting a stoplight, let's say, on, in one of the rural towns. And I can understand, you know, you got a gazillion people in Maricopa County making turns, and it's easy to get a stoplight wherever you want it. Do you have any plan to, to help the rural communities uh, get stoplights? Because we don't, we don't, we can't ma match those numbers in the rural communities. But we really need a stoplight, and we've been turned down for one that we really need in Pine Top. And I'm not familiar with the the, the one in Pine Top, but generally we use national. Um, the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices to set standards for 
when do we warrant a signal? There are, um, I believe it's seven warrants um, to do that. If we put up a signal that isn't warranted, now we, we've created a liability, because the signals will create more crashes. What we hope they will do is have less severe crashes. Because anytime I stop someone on the roadway, there's a good chance you're gonna have a rear end crash. So if we can keep traffic flowing, I know um, in those smaller areas, hey, can we use it for traffic calming? A, a different community um, had asked me, can we use them for traffic calming? That's not really what they were designed for and can create some other unintended consequences. What I would ask, um, I will ask my team to go look, is there another solution other than a signal that can make it safe for, for folks versus um, a traffic signal? In the state, I don't know, there's been talk about toll roads. Of, has there been any more thought about that in terms of funding things? Uh, and as technology improves, if we have cars that don't necessarily have tires on the road, down the road, can we construct roads that are a little cheaper to make that just keep the dust from flying up as these hovercraft fly all around the place? And then passenger rail, uh, how do you justify, what, what, what's the, the point that, uh, the subsidization, uh, Amtrak, for example, in my understanding is it doesn't really pay for itself. And I'm just wondering, uh, how do we avoid those kind of things uh, uh, in the future? Thank you. Well, I'll start with um, the easy one is we're not planning yet for, for hovercrafts. Um, <laughs> that I, I, I look forward to that day uh, that, that we can go forward. Um, the, the first question you asked me, what was it again? The, Tolls. Um, we, we have pushed out there. In Arizona right now, there is not an appetite for toll roads. Um, unless things change politically, everything we, we've looked at, because we, we have um, done some soft, hey, what if we did a, a toll facility that maybe could relieve I-10 through the West Valley of Phoenix? Um, what if we tolled an area in northeast, um, our northwest part of the state that I have an interstate that I can't even get to from Arizona. I have to leave the state and then come back to this roadway to, to do it. That may be an opportunity for tolls. But right now, um, politically, it is not a, a starter politically for tolls. We would use any revenue we got. So if there was a toll, the department is not opposed to it. Um, but it, the people who use it have to be willing to accept it. And on the passenger rail, um, I don't know that I'm equipped to answer that, that question right now. Um, not my expertise, um, for sure. I don't want Anthony to feel left out. <laughs> you look a little bored. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is what we want. I mean, think, we want things to be localized. The USDOT is you know, providing funding and oversight through highways, but we want you to own what you want locally in your state and, and in your locality. So this is actually the right conversation to have. We can provide a higher level of view of what's going on holistically, but ADOT and then you guys are the ones we want to be driving this from right. our point of view. And that goes to my point, mm -hmm. is um, the thought from the administration side on how we can make it easier on the locals to help leverage, to bring money to us to make that happen. Um, I'm not a local elected official, but I have a whole board full of them. We've talked about this many, many times, and I'm sure most of you in this room have had the same conversation. Um, it's a big burden mm -hmm. to push it down to the local and say, okay, Fed, state, you do it. State says, oh, we're not going to do it. We're going to have the locals do it. And, and it feels um, difficult to be able to move that conversation locally because now you're putting a fundraising topic onto the lowest form again. Um, but how can we work together across all levels to make that happen? Um, you know, I think the president mentioned, you know, raising the gas tax, he wasn't opposed to that. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably gonna take a federal gas tax, a state tax, and probably regional authorities to make all these things happen. We're so far behind. So I guess it's, what conversations have you had um, in the administration that we can look at partnering across all levels? Sure, uh, we've had those uh, pretty much since day one that this was the, gonna be the paradigm shift in how we're gonna move forward in, in funding transportation from a federal, state, and local level. 
Um, we have been advocating that, and, and through our grant, through our Tiger Build Infra, we have been putting forward that state and local leveraging is a criteria that we consider when you're, when you're pursuing federal funds. Uh, that being said, we, our goal is 2080, but we realize that's going to take some time to reach that. Uh, one of the proposals we had put forward for rural and small cities was a $50 billion bucket that would be straight federal funding, no leverage needed. That would be uh, not just for transportation, but remember the President's infrastructure propose, proposal was for departments, many departments. So the governor, basically how it worked was the governor would decide which transportation, waterworks, et cetera, priorities were, submit that to DOT or Interior or, or, or whichever agency. Then the allotment would go out to the to the uh, governor and the aligning agencies as they would uh, move forward on these projects. If they would came in under budget and on time, they would also have a 10% bucket for bonus payments to the state as well. And that would be direct over a fiscal year or two to help balance out the messaging we'll put forward that you know we're, we're trying to bridge you to that point, but at some point the states and localities still have to do it. You in Arizona are doing a good job. There's a lot of states that aren't. It's, it is a tough sell. It's something that we've been trying to advocate and we'll continue to. Don't forget that next year we go into our transportation reauthorization and we're, we, every, all of our modes are going to be up for reauthorization. The administration and the secretary are going to lean in hard on offering policies up that are significant changes in each of those, each of those modes. And we want to have that robust debate. That's another opportunity to get this message out of where we're seeing the paradigm shift go into the future. And as far as gas tax, VMT, all those other options are on the table. I don't know where we'll wind up. We, we are willing to engage Congress on all of those. And we want to have a robust debate. We want to avoid just a, you know, whatever the new Congress looks like, a two-year Band-Aid again. We, this is the opportunity to weigh in and do something significant. We intend to. And we'll, you might not agree with everything that we propose uh, going into the next Congress. But what we need is your voices upward to your delegation. And, and you have a pretty good delegation as it is talking to other colleagues saying, let's not miss this opportunity, let's, let's do this now. That's going to be our position, and part of it's going to continue to be a lot of what you saw in our infrastructure proposal, which is state and local leveraging has got to be a partnership and skin in the game going forward. And I think you'll see that reflected as we, go, as we start rolling out our policy for highways and all of our other different modes moving forward. But yeah, we're ready to address it, um, and we're going to have all options on the table as far as how we're going to fund the highway. You know, the trust fund with gas taxes is, is not sustainable. We have to figure out a solution to that going forward. And with electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles and ride share, you know, the burden of, of paying the gas tax falls on rural and small cities and people who are going to still use cars where there's not available transit, et cetera. And they, well, how do we address that imbalance? And, and so those are all things that we're putting uh, to paper right now and look forward to rolling out and getting everyone's reaction heading into, into 2019 and moving forward. Does that help? Okay. I wish we had the money to give you, but my my question is for you, yeah. Anthony. Yes, sir. Um, I sit on I-40, and one of our main modes of transportation in and out of the city that I represent is the Southwest Super Chief, the, the Amtrak, and it's in our understanding now that the uh, USDOT and the government are going to shut that down, and basically run Amtrak up and down the east and the west coast. Is it not more affordable to continue? Um, existing transportation and bring it to current um, uh, standards than it is to try to reinvent the wheel? Um, that's a great question. Will you follow up with me? I don't know the specifics of that. I can look into that for you and, and get you the reasoning and the data for that. Um, that's something that I know we've been taking a look at where rider, low ridership levels and return on investment isn't occurring. And so that may fall into that bucket. I can't tell you specifically. <laughs> possible too. Uh, so I'll be happy to follow up with you uh, when I get back to, to DC. Um, just grab me at, yeah, grab me afterwards. Hi, uh, Ray Armington, Star Valley. On your 260 project, uh, very needed for the last several years. And as any of you have camped in the, uh, in the north and get caught on a Sunday return trip to Phoenix, in seven, eight, ten mile backup. The problem we're encountering in Star Valley is the, the road opens up and it's, it's a NASCAR drop the flag um, after a bottleneck and we're getting speeders. Um, posted speed limit through Star Valley is 45 and we're getting in excess of 65. We have all the enforcement we can, our local uh, 
our local sheriff's office, but it just it's not enough. Uh, we have no crosswalks. We have elderly and handicapped trying to cross that highway, four lanes at 50, 55 plus. Um, we need something done before a fatality. That's where, for, the, for our citizens. Uh, I understand that sometimes a fatality is what it takes, but we'd like somebody up there to look into this um, before we have a fatality. Thank you. Understood. I think that's it. ADOT. I have not camped in the north or driven 260. So you missed out. It's yeah. beautiful. I would love to. It sounds amazing. Uh, that's an ADOC. <laughs> yeah. uh, on that, we 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 did uh, meet with the, the uh, town manager here within the last month and have agreed we are going to go out and do what we call a road safety assessment and, and look for those opportunities to um, slow pe people down and, and make it safer. And we are doing that before there's. Um, a serious crash so we, we are willing to do that good afternoon guys is there any way in the federal and the state that we could uh, like speed the process up of the the steps and the studies and that it seems like the studies and all the steps that we take to get to the road project um, when it comes to that point when we get with the federal it's so much more to do it through the federal guidelines than it would be to just to build the road through a contractor in our local areas. So is there any way in the future um, through our president and that, is there a way to narrow those um, time frames up and the studies up to make it a little more simple idea and a simple plan? Absolutely, we are doing that right now. The president issued an executive order earlier this year called One Federal Decision, which requires all the departments and agencies to work concurrently and share data and studies as opposed to the one after the other. Um, I happen to think our department does a very good job on EAS, particularly Federal Highways and others. Um, I think it's easy to identify. I used to publicly and they got mad at me, some of the problem children that we have. But they have been put on notice and in the President's executive order, there is a punitive aspect where the Office of Management and Budget has said if you don't cooperate and do this concurrently, and the President's goal is to get it from 10 years for EIS studies in your NEPA down to two. That's very ambitious, but even if we cut it down to five, three, that's significant. I think we're seeing a lot of it happen anecdotally now, and there's some more cooperation from the from the some of the agencies that aren't always cooperative. But it, there is a working group that meets to make sure we're we're doing that in Washington D.C. And I'll say the Secretary of the Army has been told that that area needs to be improved, and there have been a couple of departments and agencies that have been told that their budgets will be cut if they don't improve their process. I'm proud to say that has not happened at USDOT, and I think we actually do that effectively. And I, I, we're seeing a much better partnership, and particularly with the sharing of the data and the studies. And hopefully ADOT will concur. But um, I, it's, it's going to be a process. But we're working very hard to make sure you're, we're identifying and doing exactly what you're saying. And in addition, one, one of the things that came out of the, the last authorization is can uh, what elements can the, the federal government delegate to the state right. and some of the NEPA um, assignment is that Arizona in, in January Carla and I signed an agreement that the the state will take over the smaller projects the categorical exclusions for responsibilities and so we we have been doing those now it didn't cut any requirement it's just uh, one less review so you can streamline that that process we are in the process of doing the same thing for full NEPA and we look by the end of the year to have that agreement signed that we go forward and the state would take on that responsibility as well as that liability it comes with both and we're happy to do that <laughs> <laughs> so i have a comment and and i can find da dallas i'm going to bug uh, anthony <laughs> oh. uh, <laughs> a comment and a couple of questions um you know you mentioned going for a reauthorization and you know what can be done to improve and you know i know the administration's you know express support for p3 so i would just give a plug that one of the areas that I feel Arizona's hampered is when it comes to P3 opportunities with our highways, mm -hmm. when it comes to privatizing rest stops and exploring opportunities there to bring in private sector dollars, I think we're hamstrung compared to some of our eastern states that were, you know, grandfathered just due to age. Right. Uh, I think ADOT's done great things in the partnership with GEICO to do what they can within the framework, but I think that's one area that frees up dollars for ADOT to be able to focus on the roads and expansion like we saw in rural Arizona. So I just sort of share that as, I guess, well, unsolicited feedback. If I could say, uh, funny you should say that, I met with the governor's team this week and we may be exploring the potential of an experiment 
uh, on one or two of your rest stops. And then I'd also say in the President's overall infrastructure proposal, we propose privatizing rest stops and leaving that decision to the states. I think um, doing that um, and, and advocating that next year, which I'm pretty sure we will when we're changing all these laws and you're authorizing our agencies, is something I think we'll get a great deal of consideration. So uh, we don't disagree with you. We're just bound by what we're bound by now. We do have the ability to do experiments, but they're very limited. And uh, I know that uh, the governor, staff, and NADOT were looking at maybe some power charging stations and things like that. But you know, turning it over to Geico and, and those kind of things, and it's, I don't know that we're, we would like to be there, but I don't think Congress and some of the, some of the interest groups are yet. It'll take some work. Yeah. And so in, I guess, on the P3 front, you know, you mentioned the kind of uh, grand vision from the administration. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of those shifts is the reimbursement going from essentially going to, I think, looking at 80 percent local, 20 percent federal and leveraging it. Can you talk to us about how, where do the private dollars play into that math? Can we use, can we leverage private dollars to hit the local match? Absolutely. Or what's the vision? Whatever, however you make the, get to the 80 percent of the pie. Uh, state, local, and private. We, we feel there's a significant amount of private investment out there. Uh, my home state, the Commonwealth of Virginia, does a very good job in leveraging that where we have a managed lane system. Uh, we use P3s. They've used TIFIA loans. In fact, the largest TIFIA loan that we've given out through the Bureau um, is a billion dollars plus for our I-66 expansion, which goes out, if you've ever been to D.C. West, out towards the western part of the state, towards the mountains. Um, we're seeing other states start to look at that as well. And, you know, we interstate tolling and tolling direct, um, you know, obviously it's difficult for states to do, but managed lanes where you still have a free option, but the option to take a managed lane to seem to work well in a number of the states, particularly in Virginia, where now we have our Beltway Loop is a managed lane. Our 395 inside the Beltway is going to go. Our 95 South is going to go all the way to Fredericksburg. I-66 West, is, well, there's, there's tolling. The one controversy we have is they're tolling inside I-66 to the Beltway to D.C., but outside is going to be managed lanes. And so and now the governor of Maryland is looking to complete the loop and then out 270. So we're kind of see that network and, and growing expansion. There's groups you know, that invest transurban and other groups that do this. And so we know it's not a one size fits all if it works in Arizona, if it works in other states, Indiana, Virginia, Georgia, wherever. You know, we want it as an option. There's other um, ways to have private investment where inve the companies are investing in the economic development and those things that go around the infrastructure as well that are part of the grant application. So uh, the long-winded answer that I gave you is yes, private investment is part of the pie as you put the grant proposal forward. And I think you just answered, but to clarify, could that then also, so could, you know, doesn't have to, does it have to be dollars? Can it be land donation, in-kind donation to get to that 80 percent? So to some degree, um, as you're putting your grant proposal together, I would encourage everyone when they're looking at a kind of private piece of investment to make sure they bounce it off our policy team to make sure it fits. But yeah, we, I've seen some of that and then there's been other aspects of, of private investment we've looked at. And, and the, also in the narrative, and this is for everyone, capture the value of your long-term um, economic impact is something that we look at. It's very significant. We've had a number of grant applications that have come in where they only proposed in an infra grant proposal. We're just going to take down this overpass and then build this ramp into the port, and then that'll help freight traffic move and move safely. Okay, great project, not super sexy. What they left out is when they took down the overpass from their football stadium, they had three billion dollars in private investment to build from the football stadium down to their uh, the beginning of their city, an entire new waterfront, which included autonomous vehicle and all kinds of other things that we like, and they had, the, they had the data and the return on investment to show, and they left that completely out of their narrative. So as you, as you all move forward, and I know ADOT moves, says capture all that for us and that narrative, that, that data and that ROI is very important to us as we look to invest our dollars moving forward. If you'll indulge me, one last of question. Course. You mentioned that with the build grants and with that shift from Tiger, you're looking for transformative projects mm -hmm. and trying to get more bang with your buck with maybe smaller, more rural. Can you talk about is that traffic mitigation? Is that sa safety improvement? Is that something sexy like ITS or AV compatibility? Can you talk about it's, what it's we all should of the, look at? It's all of the above. I, I've toured some, uh, some things this morning where you know, $9 million towards a $30 million project to help build this uh, you know, slip lane or build another off off ramp into a larger area where you can't directly get into the town where they want to do the economic development, that's transformative. Autonomous vehicle routes and those kind of things, that's transformative. You know, traffic mitigation and others, we have other kind of uh, buckets of money that help with those kind of things through 
uh, through our other modes. But yeah, I mean, we're looking to have impact on where, you know, I, I hate to pick on the large urban centers, but where, you know, we give $25 million to a large city, that's great. But when I give $25 million to a region or a small city, that's going to have impact on an interchange, that's going to work with traffic flow, move freight traffic off X and Y. I mean, those are things that we look to do and we want to do. And that's going to have significant impact on your, lo on your localities, and people are going to notice that. And that's kind of the vision that we have. And I think that's why you saw the uptick in rural and small city applications in this round of build went from, I think, 25% of last year's, and now it's 60% of the entire 800-plus applications we just got in. So thank you very much, both of you, for your thoughts and your comments. As I drive around, uh, there he is. Uh, I'm incognito. I'm doing this on purpose. <laughs> I was looking um, up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I drive around the, the state of Arizona and both urban and rural, um, uh, what I find is traffic is flowing generally at the speed limit. And then you have quite a few who, what I call, pick a speed, any speed. And they drive their own speed, not necessarily within the flow of traffic. I'm old enough, uh, especially in Arizona, to remember where we had not only a speed limit, but a minimum speed on our freeways, of which then individuals who are impeding the flow of traffic could be cited for violating minimum speeds. So Dallas, this one would be for you. Is there any thought, any conversation about um, posting our signs where they have speed limits to include minimum speeds? It's a safety issue. Understand, and, and right now there there has not been those. That we we can take it back. There are some laws that if you're impeding so many vehicles, basically it's four that you're supposed to pull over and let them go through. Does that happen very often? No, it doesn't. But I can take that forward. Yes. Started the conversation. I've got one for, uh, for the pair of you, actually. It has to do with uh, funding, just for a change. And it also has to do with gasoline taxes. Yes, it is not sustainable in the long run. For the next 15 to 20 years, though, if you do not increase the rate of the gas taxes, we're going to go absolutely nowhere in transportation. That's number one. At least it should be indexed. It hasn't been indexed for the past 25 years. It just so happens that the state of Arizona and the federal government are almost in lockstep on this particular situation, which is part of the reason why 85% of the population of the state of Arizona can only get by because they have a half-cent sales tax dedicated for transportation. Most importantly, though, the one thing I would urge you is if this 80-20 match comes up with 80 local and 20 federal, that's a non-starter for the state of Arizona. Number one, we actually have 94.3% federal match on most because of the sliding scale. And number two, I've heard estimates as big as 50-50, it actually costs cities and towns that use federal funds almost 50% of their own money to get a federally funded project done. So an 80-20, I beg your pardon, 80 local match, why would anyone actually request federal 20% federal funds to do a project that they could easily do with their own money to start with? Um, from that point of view, no questions, but if you, can, if you could respond with regard to increasing the gas tax or more importantly, perhaps indexing it, I'd be very interested to hear it. Sure. We haven't determined exactly where we're going to be on the policy yet. I think that's uh, to be determined and announced soon. Uh, but we are and have said, and, and President Trump was the first president since President Clinton to say that that discussion is on the table. I assure you that it is. And then we'll be rolling out how we intend to engage next year as we head into the reauthorization. Uh, and then the, 80, the 2080 match is a goal we put forward. Uh, we, have, we realize it's going to take time to get to that kind of split, and it's, a, again, a, a, a new paradigm shift, so it doesn't surprise me to hear that's 90-10 on the federal, state, and local match. Um, we are, but we are starting to see increased state and local match on every grant application that has come in that I would say averages 40-60, 50-50, 70-30 at this point. So 
it's anecdotal. We have data that we're collecting to, to, to show that you know, that is moving this way, but there's not going to be some mandate by 20x, you have to have a 2080 split. That's a, it's a theoretical goal that where we see the long-term funding capabilities of the federal government and where the state and loca states and the localities and private investment you know, can leverage that to the, our proposal was to use one federal dollar to get one state dollar to get one local dollar and get another dollar private investment because we think there's 1.5 trillion in investment out there. And that's what we want you to use is the limited federal dollars to try to go find those additional. So that was our proposal. I understand completely that it's going to be tough on states and localities to find that additional funding. But, you know, we want to have that conversation and show that this is the way that it's, it's moving forward given our limitations in the federal government right now and probably for a long time. Uh, if we assume that autonomous vehicles are coming and they're not going to stop and within the next 10, 15, 20 years they're going to be very dominant, uh, five, okay. <laughs> so highway planning obviously projects out beyond five years. Mm -hmm. When you build a road it's going to be there way beyond five years. So, so what things or lessons are you putting into your planning and what should we put into the money we budget for road construction to take into account this, this new reality of autonomous vehicles? Sure. Um, in, in the beginning of October, we'll issue autonomous vehicle guidance 3.0 that's going to address the specifics of that. Uh, we've been in touch with a lot of the DOTs, and they are already aware of autonomous freight that's going to be moving forward. And then you know, lo the localities are more in the autonomous vehicle of the transit and people movers. So we're trying to determine to let the localities determine if, if and when they're ready to do that. But I'll just say that we just awarded an infra grant to Wisconsin. Uh, to the, I think it was $156 million, which is one of the largest we've ever done. And it's Foxconn just moved in when the president was able to have them uh, reinvest and come back over. We're going to build TVs in the United States for the first time in a long time. And to accommodate the, what that takes, they are going to widen, forget the interstate between Milwaukee and Chicago, that's going to go from 4 to 12 lanes and it built into the exterior, the interior is an autonomous freight line. So that's going to be already built in, ready to go whenever those vehicles are ready to move the freight from Milwaukee and Foxconn down to Chicago and wherever else it needs to go. So we're starting, we're, we're working with the DOTs to get that messaging out that where you're starting to see it and working with industry and where, you know, the in, the, where they're going, that's something that we have to get into the mindset. So we're trying to push it through our guidance when we issue our guidance again. And we're, we, you know, when we meet at AASHTO, which is a conference for all our state DOT secretaries and et cetera, we're, we're having panels and continuously moving that message forward that this is coming. And we see. I think that's the, the, the cities and localities are going to have to determine where they see that going. Um, you know, we're certainly seeing changeover from the old transit and bus routes to electric buses, BRT, and ride share and a number of things. So you're starting to see that trend move forward. And when a locality determines that autonomous vehicles is something that they think their, their public would use in a small sense, I don't know that it's ever going to, at this point, you know, have long, the long bus routes and things, but where feasible. Uh, I was just in Jacksonville, and they're looking at eliminating their transit and their, their it's a, basically a monorail transit system and then their bus system along their waterfront. This was part of the, that was the infra grant I was talking about where they didn't include their investment to just an autonomous loop from the stadium back and forth and stopping at all these restaurants. So I think it'll be pieces. Eventually, I think it'll be something longer term, but short term, there's the ability to have autonomous vehicles. They're cheaper, easier to use. You know, the, the cybersecurity and those issues are there and being addressed. It's just going to be, we want to leave it to you to determine how you want to move forward. I, I think one of the other challenges in planning that is, what is that going to do? Um, if, if autonomous vehicles became affordable, would I still be by myself? You know, or, or we just have the same number of vehicles, but the, the driver's not doing. Will it encourage ride share? Um, I, I think our generations, this next generation who's, um, very comfortable with rideshare may change some things in our planning. So yeah, a, a transportation planner has a, a difficult job now because they're predicting the future a little bit more than they had to do in the past. Before we looked at, okay, we think growth is going to be here, we need this many lanes. Now we're going to, well, how are people going to use different modes? So it's going to be a definite challenge. One last question here before we finish. Um, Dallas, you mentioned earlier in your presentation about the I-11. And so, Anthony, I kind of want to 
convey this to you. Obviously, we're in the midst of a Tier 1 EIS on that. Yep. Um, as you may or may not know, the proposal of uh, I-11 is a uh, uh, very interesting considering it's sometimes called the Canamex, which the idea would be hopefully that someday this uh, major interstate goes all the way from the border in Nogales all the way through Arizona, up through uh, Nevada, and then on up into Canada. And some of the things that are tra transpiring now is we know that there's some 12, 12 and a half billion dollars in commerce that comes from Mexico up the freeway system as we have it now. But if we if we had these two major areas of, of Las Vegas and the Phoenix metro area connected, uh, there's the very real potential that you could see an increase of somewhere in the neighborhood of $50 billion of commerce coming through Mexico and up through Arizona. Uh, you know, $50 billion changed a lot of people's lives. And so just kind of interested to see uh, the DOT's uh, perspective on some, uh, some sort of a major interstate like I-11 and this Tier 1 EIS going forward. What does that look like for Arizona? And, and uh, you know, what does the, the Department of Transportation foresee in its potential to create something that it had done for many, many years uh, throughout the history, uh, the 50s, 60s, 70s, and we haven't seen something major like that in a really long time. Yeah. Can we go first? Sure. Uh, we are very aware of that project, and I think there's been a number of builder infogrants submitted on it. I know Highways has been uh, made aware at the leadership level of looking at the long-term impact, and we've we've heard and from both your congressional delegations here and in Nevada of the long-term impact, and all the way up to Canada. So I don't know that we've made specific. I know that Tier One IES is something that's in process, but. We, we get the importance of that potential of the corridor, and so does the White House. So we're going to be determining how we want to move forward on that, particularly as, as ADOT looks to uh, do a number of things there as well, and we want to be partners with that. But yeah, we, it's, it's on our, our radar. Perfect. Well, let's give you guys a big round of applause. Thank you very much for your participation today. Again, it's been a real honor to have them here, and we're thankful for uh, all of your participation and your questions in driving this presentation. Uh, we'll go ahead and close this, and the next presentation will begin in about 20 minutes.